My name is Nick Perrin. I uh, have known Bill Senior for a number of years now. We met first when he came uh, to Eastern PA, uh, I suppose like six, seven years ago now. And we stayed in touch on and off. We r regularly had Starbucks together. And so I'm a big fan of Bill's and, and have always been keen to hear about what he's been up to and the ways that he's been conceiving ministry. And so uh, today I'm a professor at Wheaton College, been there for about four or five years. I'm also doing a research stint here at Princeton Theological Seminary. I taught at Biblical Seminary for two years. Well, before coming to Biblical, I was in London and I worked with uh, N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, as his research assistant for three years. Received a uh, call to come to Biblical, came and uh, initially rented in Hatfield, but ended up buying a house uh, in the Allentown area, so we were up in the Lehigh Valley. But uh, Biblical is uh, doing some really interesting things with postmodernism and uh, reaching out to a postmodern generation. I was very happy to be part uh, of Biblical's program and stay in touch with those guys and eagerly watch what they're up to every step of the way. Uh, I have a wife named Cami. We've been married for 15 years. I met her in St. Louis and uh, uh, we've been involved in ministry really ever since the get-go even when i've been teaching we always see ourselves as, as doing ministry and involved in ministerial type of stuff we have two boys nathaniel and luke age 13 and 12 and uh they'll be certainly coming along our first sunday together they, they might have other church obligations after that but uh that's our, that's our tribe. In October, I hope to be doing a four-week series on forgiveness in the Gospel of Luke. I focus in particular on four encounters. Uh, the first encounter takes place in Luke chapter 4, where Jesus comes back to his hometown and talks about his ministry of forgiveness. Uh, I also focus on Luke chapter 7, the woman who comes and anoints Jesus' feet. Uh, that, too, is a very striking incident and I want to talk about what exactly forgiveness means there. We also have the account, this is week three, of Zacchaeus. Uh, we know the story of Zacchaeus, but there's a lot of things going on in that Zacchaeus story that we don't touch, touch on. And if we keep ourselves at a kind of fifth grade Sunday school level understanding of Zacchaeus, we won't really be getting at the, what Luke is after in recording the Zacchaeus event for us. And then last of all, in the fourth and final week, I'll be looking at the thief on the cross and that encounter there. My overriding goal uh, in this is to look at forgiveness with fresh eyes. Sometimes forgiveness can be such a, like almost a cliche or a kind of static theological abstraction. And what I really want to do through these texts is to really get our uh, heads and hearts around what Luke is saying about forgiveness and how, if we really grapple uh, with forgiveness, how this not just has personal implications, uh, but implications affecting every aspect of our existence, social, political, economic, and so on. Uh, I might step on a few toes, but I think if the gospel is rightly preached, you will step on a few toes. Sometimes the way we tend to receive the gospel and think about the gospel is in a strictly individualistic framework. And I believe that Jesus was actually, he was of course he was concerned about the individual, but he's thinking about these broad structures changing under the weight of the gospel and the gospel being a transformative force for reaching out into society, the matrix of society, transforming that. And if we insist on, on keeping Jesus' forgiveness strictly as a kind of inward, personal, psychological reality, uh, we are cutting ourselves off from this richness of the gospel that makes us as a church relevant to society as a whole. So when, when unbelievers, people outside the church, look at Christians and say, so what difference does that really make to issues that I deal with? I mean, I don't really need inner peace. In some ways, what we have to say as Christians is, you know, the gospel speaks to every area of life. Now, I'm not minimizing uh, personal forgiveness. That's just the takeoff point. We have to have that down, but it's the beginning of something that uh, reaches out beyond the individual. Two, uh, about a year to two years ago, there was a book published with Thomas Nelson called Lost in Transmission, What We Can Know About the Words of Jesus. Uh, this book was a response to Bart Ehrman's best-selling book, uh, Misquoting Jesus. 
And in my book, I, I in some ways do a counter to what Bart Ehrman does. Ehrman gives his own account of how he fell away from Christianity, what fell away from Christ, through the study of scriptures. And in my book, I actually talk about my spiritual intellectual journey, how raised in an unbelieving home, I came to Christ and came to many opposite conclusions he did through the stu study of the same scriptures. I think it's a pretty accessible book. It's, pretty, uh, it's not a difficult read. Uh, I think it would be fun to get a gr group of people together to discuss uh, some of the issues, theological issues, but also discuss some of the historical background. And, and uh, it would be, if it would be helpful for me to be there to help pull things together, then I'd be happy to be put to use. I I'm finishing up a book called Jesus the Temple. And uh, that, that should be coming out next year. In this book, Jesus the Temple, uh, it's a book about the historical Jesus. I argue that, that Jesus' program was a program that spoke to Israel as a whole. That, and that what I mean by that is not just Israel as a religious people, but again, as people with social and economic uh, needs and, and part of his calling uh, as bringing about the new temple was to set the fractured society right through his ministry, through his calling, uh, as a way that was consistent with the gospel he was preaching. So this is something that's often overlooked about Jesus, but something that's really, really important. So that's fun, and that will be coming out hopefully next year. Uh, I'm also beginning to write a book on Irenaeus. Irenaeus was a second century early church father. He was Bishop of Lyon. Uh, around 170, 180 or so, came into a very difficult situation. Irenaeus has written for us five books, the books against heresies. So he is uh, a key figure in fighting the heretics of the second century. My interest in Irenaeus is getting at what he saw as the key essential of the gospel. So we can figure that out, or at least we can hope to figure that out, by seeing what he honed in on as what was problematic with the Gnostics. In other words, if you were to sit Irenaeus down and say, Irenaeus, what's so bad about these guys? Yeah, bottom line, why, why can't they be part of our Orthodox Church? And if we listen to what Irenaeus says, I think this has implications uh, not just for understanding uh, what the gospel was for Irenaeus, but understanding what true orthodoxy is and, and will give us a sharper vision of what the gospel should be. In some ways, I, I wonder whether the contemporary church isn't closer to the Gnostics than what Irenaeus uh, would envisage as true orthodoxy. I don't know if this will end up on the web, but just for the record, Aubrey was a great student, Aubrey Zenyard. She has a lot of her dad's interest in theological stuff. I know that she, she tells me she chats with her dad about theology all the time. And uh, if I had a daughter, I have two sons, but if I had a daughter, I'd be proud to have a daughter like Aubrey. So, uh, I see her from time to time when I go work out at the gym. She's almost always there. So, so Aubrey is uh, one of the lingering connections that I have with Bill.